Okay, welcome back to the 4th century. Um, tonight we're talking about the first ecumenical council of the church, the Council of Nicaea. If you don't know what that means, I'll tell you. Um, and then in the second hour tonight we're going to talk about the creed that resulted from the Council of Nicaea and also the second ecumenical council. So um, that's the plan for tonight. Now, um, let's talk about the Council of Nicaea. You remember where we've been, I hope. We were talking about the Arian controversy last week. Um, and so now we're going to see where that goes. But before we get there, just want to do a couple of things. When we started this course, um, one of the first things we talked about in the first you know, couple of weeks or whatever was uh, that we saw two ways that the church determined what was orthodox or correct belief. And uh, the two ways that the church determined orthodoxy were, uh, first, apostolic succession, remember that, and then the canon, development of, of uh, the New Testament canon. Now today we're going to look at two more ways that the church determines orthodoxy. One is councils, and the other is the result of the council, creeds. And of course the point is going to be for the, um, the, the bishops of the councils to draw the lines of boundary around what is orthodox. In other words, um, by drawing these boundary lines, uh, they are defining not only correct belief, uh, but they're really defining the church in the sense of you know, what one has to believe to be considered within the mainstream or Catholic church. Um, now again, I'm using the word Catholic here in the sense of its original meaning, the universal church. But remember, it already has the exclusive nature built into it in the sense that you know, the, the boundaries that we're drawing are the boundaries within which you have to stay, color inside the lines, if you want to be considered Catholic. If you go outside the bounds, you are no longer considered Catholic. And why is that important? For the sake of unity. Because if, um, if too much uh, diversity of belief is allowed, then we no longer have one church anymore, right? Then we have multiple churches. And so really, all of this is for the sake of unity. All right, so think about it. If correct doctrine depends on apostolic succession, and if apostolic succession is centered in the bishops, right? The bishops are the successors uh, of the apostles. Then when you need to make a major theological decision, what do you do? You gather bishops together. And the bishops meet in councils, or uh, I'm using the word synod to, to speak of a smaller council. So the bishops gather in synods or councils, and they talk it out. They debate, they vote. And um, often the result of these councils is the writing of a creed or a statement of faith. Sometimes it's referred to as the rule of faith or the rule of truth. Uh, but a creed outlines doctrine, acceptable doctrine. And by outlining the acceptable doctrine, it excludes the doctrine that's not acceptable, right? And of course, you probably know this, but the word creed comes from the Latin credo, meaning I believe. So this is why uh, the creeds usually start with I believe or we believe, something like that. Now, in the early church, um, most likely every city or, or bishop or catechetical school had its own statement of faith that it used in the baptismal ritual. Um, sometimes they are uh, very simple, sometimes they're more complicated, but they're uh, probably um, done interrogatively. In other words, the presider asks, do you believe? And then you respond with a yes, theoretically. Um, but it all goes back to the baptismal formula that we see at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go into the world, disciple the nations, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the, the creeds, as statements of faith, are going to be built on a nice three-point outline, right? Something about the Father, something about the Son, something about the Holy Spirit. At least that's the, uh, that's the basic structure that we're going to see. 
Um, and so the, the creeds or these early statements of faith were used as a test for membership. You want to be baptized? You need to agree with this. Um, they were probably also used as tools of catechesis, although as we discussed, early catechesis was more about um, morality than it was about theology. But um, the creeds were probably used that way. Later on, it becomes clear that as a product of a council, a creed is a handy way to put the theological boundaries in writing. So a council could write a creed in reaction against heresies. And um, ultimately, heresies are interpreting scripture one way, and what comes to be known as orthodoxy is interpreting scripture a different way. And the creed represents the orthodox interpretation over against the heretical interpretation. And remember my law number one, right? Heresy forces orthodoxy to define itself. And this is never more clear as in the production of the creeds. Because when we look at the Nicene Creed, it is written primarily in response to Arianism, right? Okay, so um, the more heresies popped up, the more the creeds became theological. And this is exactly what is about to happen at uh, the Council of Nicaea. Now, in practice, councils are only binding over the areas that are represented by the bishops in attendance, right? So if, uh, if the council is attended by bishops from a certain region, then the council is theoretically only binding over that region. But as we saw in the Arian controversy, we had a situation where we had opposing councils or opposing uh, metropolitan synods, one in Alexandria and one in Nicomedia. The Alexandrian one uh, was, was the proponent of what we'll call orthodoxy in this case. The one in Nicomedia supported Arius. And so now, not only do we have competing bishops, we have competing councils. So what do you do when you have competing councils? If you have two regional councils that are at odds, you need a council that is authoritative for worldwide Christianity. You need a council that is over the other uh, opposing councils. Now, if you want to have a council that's authoritative for worldwide Christianity, that means you need to gather bishops from all over the world. And a worldwide council is called an ecumenical council. Ecumenical meaning worldwide. And so what we're going to see here is that the Emperor Constantine will convene the first worldwide council of bishops. Now, before he gets to that point, though, Constantine thought he could nip this Arian thing in the bud. And he wrote letters to Alexander of Alexandria and to Arius. The letters were delivered by his right-hand man. Remember uh, the bishop Osius? Osius delivered the letters. And the letters basically demand that Alexander and Arius patch up their differences and, if need be, agree to disagree. Because remember, Constantine's main concern is the unity of the church. He's finally unified the empire. Whew. Oops, what about the church, right? He had hoped the church would help him hold the empire together. Who's going to hold the church together? The church is threatening to split, at least in the east. In the East, the church is threatening to split over this Aryan thing. I mean, the West has its Novationists and its Donatists, so the West has its own problems. But um, Constantine's main concern is the unity of the church. And in his letters to Arius and Alexander, he says that this issue is too trivial to even worry about it. Now remember, this is the Aryan controversy that had the whole Eastern church in an uproar. And here's Constantine saying, this issue is too trivial. It's too esoteric to even argue about it. The reality is Constantine himself leans toward Arianism at this point. And he's got to backpedal and get on board with the Orthodox side um, at the council. But at any rate, uh, Constantine writes these letters where he scolded both Arius and Alexander. He says to Arius, you should never have opposed your bishop. He says to Alexander, you should never have pressed the issue. And he calls both of them childish and said that they should just agree to disagree. 
For Constantine, the bigger issue was actually the fact that the, um, we, we had different ways of calculating the date for Easter. So you have um, at least two different ways. And um, so that was a bigger issue for Constantine because he was worried that if Christians the world over were celebrating Easter on different dates, then that would be uh, more divisive, or at least it would have the perception of being more divisive. So, um, so for him, that was the bigger issue. But of course, as you know, Alexander and Arius could not simply agree to disagree. So in late 324 or early 325, a synod was held in Antioch to address the Arian controversy. And Osius was the presider. He chaired that council. At that council, Eusebius of Caesarea, remember him? He's our first church historian. Eusebius of Caesarea was accused of being an adoptionist. And he kind of was. Um, Eusebius was a student of Origen and, in fact, wrote a defense of Origen because Origen himself had been accused of heresy. So by defending Origen, Eusebius got himself into trouble. And uh, there are aspects of Origen and other elements that sort of all you know, come together. Uh, and so that Eusebius is kind of leaning towards Arianism. Um, and so at this council in Antioch, Eusebius wasn't enthusiastic enough for the other bishops in his support of Alexander against Arius, and so he was accused of being an Arian. And the council resulted in the writing of a creed, and that creed made the specific distinction between the concepts of generation and creation. And we've been over this, so this should be familiar to you. But the point is, is that the creed says that Christ is generated, begotten, but not created. Generated, but not created. And Eusebius of Caesarea refused to sign that creed. Now, by this time, Constantine had already decided to convene a worldwide council. Um, and so the Synod of Antioch temporarily excommunicated Eusebius um, and that they would reconvene in Nicaea to settle the matter and, and the final decision would be made there. And so in 325, we have the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. It's the Council of Nicaea because that's the name of the city where it was held. You will see this spelled sometimes without that middle A. Uh, that's okay, but that's the way uh, we spell it now. Um, now, you know I'm not big on making me you memorize dates. But if you don't know the date of the first ecumenical council, and if I ever meet you 10 years from now and I ask you, you better know it. 325 Council of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council of the church. Bishops came from all over the Eastern Empire. According to Athanasius, there were 318 bishops, but other uh, other people who recorded the events have different numbers. So um, remember, these councils don't just meet on one day. They meet over a period of time. And so it could be that some bishops were in and out. It could be that some people are not only counting bishops, uh, but are counting other people. Because there were um, priests and some lay people at this council. Um, there were confessors who were there, and they were treated as having great authority. Remember, the charismatic authority. There were some hermits that were there who were also treated with great respect. Um, by the way, a little bit of a spoiler alert where we're going after this, but if you think about this, if the persecution is over and there's going to be no more martyrdoms, what will take the place of martyrdom? What's going to be the new martyrdom? Assassination. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> although there's going to be some of that. But uh, no, asceticism. Right, um, being a hermit or an ascetic, that that becomes kind of a spiritual martyrdom, dying to yourself. So that will take the place of martyrs. That's a martyr. That's an aside, but but we are going to get there. Um, there weren't very many bishops who came from the West, but the fact that they were all invited means that the council will be binding on them as well. The bishop of Rome was not healthy enough to make the trip. He was too old. 
um, but, uh, but there were uh, some people that he sent to represent him and a small delegation of other bishops from, from the West. The presider, the chair of the council, was our old friend Osius of Cordova, and Constantine himself took a seat among the bishops and moderated. And so he would, if he thought someone spoke well, he would compliment them, and he would you know, put his two cents in from time to time. So again, you know, look at how Constantine has, on the one hand, given bishops the authority of civil magistrates, but on the other hand, he's given himself the right to sit at the, at, the, at the table with the bishops. Who else is there? Well, obviously, Alexander of Alexandria and Athanasius. Remember, Athanasius went as Alexander's right-hand man and deacon, and Athanasius will succeed him as the next bishop of Alexandria. So Athanasius was kind of there as Alexander's secretary. And obviously Arius was there and his followers, including our other Eusebius, Eusebius of Nicomedia, is also there. And of course Eusebius of Caesarea is there as well. Um, so the main question for the council is going to be, is the Son co-eternal with the Father or not? Is the Son co-eternal with the Father, or was there a time when he was not? Was there a time when he did not exist? Now, secondarily, are these guys heretics? Is the other big question, right? Is Eusebius uh, of Caesarea a heretic? Is Arius a heretic? Where are we going to draw those lines of boundary? And one of the first things they did was call up old Eusebius of Caesarea because he's already been um, declared a heretic at the Synod of Antioch, and he's been temporarily excommunicated. So, what do you have to say for yourself, Eusebius of Caesarea? And he produced the baptismal creed in use in Caesarea. This is the creed we use. The creed was examined by the council, and it was determined that there was nothing wrong with it. It was orthodox. Now, of course, here's the thing. It was very general. It's not specific enough. Um, and so the, the bishops of the council basically said, this is okay, this is orthodox, we'll say, Eusebius, that you're not a heretic. And they decided to use Eusebius's creed as the template for the creed that would be the product of the council. But Eusebius's creed by itself was not specific enough to refute Arianism. Because after all, Eusebius leaned that way anyway, and he was okay with the creed. So they knew that they would have to add to it. That's what we'll talk about in the next hour. Um, now remember how adoptionism um, not only denies the divinity of Christ, but adoptionism also denies the uniqueness of Christ among humanity. In other words, Jesus Christ is basically one of us and not much more. And of course, Arianism has the added element of sort of quasi-divinity. Um, but ultimately, um, any of us could earn that elevated status of quasi-divinity. So the point being that, you know, this sort of removes all the uniqueness about the person of Christ among humanity. So the, the bishops of the council who wanted to refute Arianism knew that to do that, they had to come up with a way to include in the creed a statement that would emphasize Jesus' uniqueness. Right? And so, um, and, and it had to be enough of an emphasis that the Arians couldn't be okay with it. Because the problem is, you know, this uh, Arianism is not the old kind of adoptionism that just denies Jesus' divinity out of hand. It does have a kind of qualified divinity for Christ. It, so it does kind of acknowledge some uniqueness of Christ. So they needed to say more than simply that Jesus is unique. He must be unique um, on the level of his very essence, on the ontological level, and he must be eternally unique. So it's not enough that he starts out like us, but becomes unique. He must be eternally unique. To put it another way, he has to be more like God than like us. 
Um, and remember the Christology of descent, right? Uh, the, the Orthodox Christology of descent says he is God who becomes human, not a man who becomes a god. And so somehow the bishops of the council are going to want to emphasize that aspect of Christology. So the Alexandrian bishops, who are leading the way here, needed to come up with a way to describe Christ that emphasized his oneness with God, that, that emphasized the way in which he is the same as God, the same essence, the same substance, just as we get from Irenaeus and Tertullian and Novation. And, and that would give them something that they could state in the creed that the Arians could not agree to and that that would exclude Arianism. And so, um, a new word was introduced into the creed, into the rule of faith. Uh, it's a Greek word. Uh, some of you already know where this is going. The word is homoousios. Now this is the Greek homo, meaning same, and ousios, meaning essence. Same essence, right? So the word means of the same essence, which is to say the same thing as what Tertullian uh, meant by the same substance. And so when we, when, when we say that the Father and Son are of the same essence, this is the same thing that we, we already saw in Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Novation. Um, now, when you translate this into Latin and then transliterate the Latin into English, you get the sort of English word consubstantial. But again, you can see it right in the word. Um, you know, with or the same substance, same substance. Um, so that's, that's the English version of that word. Now, who can tell me where the word consubstantial is in the Bible? You're right, it's not. And, and that's going to be the problem because the Orthodox bishops, right, the bishops who hold the position that will be determined to be the Orthodox position, the Orthodox bishops want to include this word in the creed. And the Arians, the, those who are going to be determined to be the heretics, uh, their, their complaint is, hey, that word's not biblical. Now, the word's been around. It's not brand new. It's, it's been around, and, and there were some people... Uh, like Dionysius of Rome, who had said that the Father and Son are homoousios, and he probably got that from Novation and Tertullian before him. Uh, but there were others, like Eusebius of Nicomedia, who wrote specifically that the Father and Son are not homoousios. So, which is it? And in fact, what the council did was pulled out Eusebius of Nicomedia's letter, where he argues against the use of the word homoousios, read it out, and condemned it. And knew that because the word would not be acceptable to Eusebius of Nicomedia, if they put it into the creed, that that would accomplish what they wanted to do in the creed. Because it wouldn't be acceptable to the Arians. So that word became the key to separating the Orthodox from the Arians. Now, What's important to notice about this is that for the first time in the church's history, the Bible alone can't solve the problem. In other words, um, every biblical word that the bishops tried to insert into the creed, the Arians could agree to it. And you know we talked about the development of the New Testament canon, we talked about patristic exegesis, and we said that, you know, if at all possible, the early church uh, interpreters liked to it, use scripture to interpret scripture. Um, but here's where they run out of scripture. Here's where the bishops had to go outside of scripture to, in, to interpret scripture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um... The creed will be written with this word in it, and um, 
Arius and many of his followers could not accept the word because to them it sounded either Gnostic or, uh, or modalist, Sabellian. Um, and so, I mean, again, if you think about it from the perspective of an adoptionist, to say that the Father and Son are the same essence sounds like you're saying that the Father and Son are the same thing, or one and the same. And, of course, that's not exactly what the, the word was meant to mean, but that's what it sounded like to the Arians. And so, at, at this point, different factions uh, sort of emerge, which were probably already there, but um, they, they, they come to light, and um, as, as different groups within this sort of Aryan camp propose other solutions. So, for example, uh, the Aryans wanted to say, no, let's not say the Son is uh, the, the same essence as the Father. Let's say the Son is of similar essence as the Father. The Son is like the Father, um, but, but what they mean by that is uh, more in terms of the, the Son's will conforming to the Father's will. They're not comfortable with the essence language. Um, uh, so, so some of them are saying, that let's say the Son is of similar substance. Some of them are saying, let's not use the word substance or essence at all. Let's just say the Son is like the Father. Um, and so these are uh, various forms of Arianism. Some of them are called semi-Arianism. We don't need to worry too much about that. There were even some who were more Arian than Arius and who wanted to say, the Son is nothing like the Father. Uh, the Son is unlike the Father. What's important about this is, uh, we, you know, we're not going to go into detail about these different factions, because it's really not necessary at this point. But, but the important thing to notice is that after the Council, these different groups will solidify into different factions. And they will even oppose each other. And eventually, that opposition will... Um, be a benefit to the, the, the pro-Nicene party because some of these people will either cancel each other out or some of them will go so far in the other direction that it will cause the, the people on the fence to go with the Orthodox party. So it ends up helping in the long run. But, it, but I'll tell you right now, another spoiler alert, that just because a council is going to declare Arianism a heresy does not mean Arianism is going to go away. It's going to be around for a while, and it's going to be a matter of debate for, for a while. Now, in the end, though, the word sticks, and the word is used in the creed. And um, then, at the end of the council, all of the bishops are expected to sign the creed as a way of you know, saying that they accept it, that they believe it, and that they will teach it when they get home. Now, at this point, most of the followers of Arius simply found their own way to interpret the word loosely and signed the creed to stay out of trouble. And in fact, Eusebius of Caesarea was one of these. But he was so uncomfortable with the word that he felt he had to write a letter to the people back in his home, in his hometown, uh, that would get there ahead of him to explain, okay, now I'm coming home with a creed, it's got a word in it, the word's not in the Bible, but don't freak out, it's going to be okay. You know, so he felt like he had to sort of, you know, um, defuse the situation before he even got there, because he really was not comfortable with it. Um, Eusebius of Nicomedia and a couple others did sign the creed, but refused to sign the part at the end of the creed that condemns the heretics. And you'll see that when we look at the creed. Um, and the council said, well, you know, we'll give you a couple of days to think about it. <laughs> and then they sort of, the council a couple of days later dispersed and they skipped town and um, left without ever signing that last part of the creed. And when Constantine, the emperor, found out that Eusebius of Nicomedia had not signed the last part of the creed, he told the city of Nicomedia to get themselves a new bishop. So I'm pointing that out because I want you to see how t you know, the, the situation is going to flip in, in just a few minutes. Um, now, Arius himself refused to sign the creed, and some of his followers also didn't sign it. So Arius and anyone who refused to sign the creed 
was excommunicated. Arius himself was banished uh, from Alexandria. Now, notice again, this is, the, this is new because now if a person is a heretic, he's also an outlaw, right? I mean, because the, the emperor is backing the decisions of the council. So it's one thing to be excommunicated from the church, but when the emperor is now backing the decisions of the council, that means you're also, you, you can also be exiled as well as excommunicated. So uh, those Arians who didn't sign it were ex excommunicated. Now, the creed was meant to be a standard. Um, just like we talked about the word canon means a standard, or like a yardstick by which other things are measured. The creed was all also meant to be a standard by which local creeds could be measured. So it isn't even necessarily the case that everyone had to use the new creed, but the point was is that you took this new creed home and you made sure that if you used another creed at home that it was consistent. You couldn't teach anything that uh, contradicted the new creed. So the creed was supposed to be a standard to compare uh, your local creeds. Uh, but because it had a word in it that's not in Scripture, uh, some people claimed that it was an innovation. It was, it was too new. The way heresy is often seen as an innovation, right? Older is better. And here is an exception to that rule because um, this word was perceived as new. And so... In the end, most of the bishops, including Athanasius eventually, when he became bishop, most of the bishops just kind of shelved it for a while, let things cool off. They didn't necessarily use the creed right away. But by the mid-fourth century, the creed becomes pretty standard. It becomes a sort of litmus test for orthodoxy. If you want to call yourself a Christian, and by that we mean a Catholic Christian, not a heretical Arian or some other version. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you must agree to what's in the creed. And the creed becomes kind of the minimum standard for, um, for orthodoxy. And in fact, you know, keeping it to a minimum is, is kind of intentional because you, you want to keep the mainstream church as large as possible. You don't want to ex excommunicate too many people. You don't want to exclude too much. So the creed is written uh, just enough to exclude the extreme heresies that we've been talking about, adoptionism, Arianism on the one side, and, um, and also Gnosticism, modalism on the other. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's only about a page long, so you can see that they didn't try to uh, come up with every possible scenario. So the, the main result, then, of the Council of Nicaea is the production of the creed. But this is not yet the creed that we call the Nicene Creed. And uh, we're going to talk in our second hour about that um, because we're going to look at the creed as it was written at Nicaea. And then we're going to talk about the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople and look at how the creed was updated. So the creed that we know as the Nicene Creed, the one that's in the hymnal or whatever, that is technically the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed because it's the product of both the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. Now, um, before we... Yeah, question there? Yes. How come they name it that way then, like the Nicaea Council? It's because it's just too long. I mean, that is technically the name of it, but who wants to say that, you know? Who, Ni the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. I'm not even... Yeah, I'm not even sure I'm saying it right. <laughs> um, just Yeah, it's just too cumbersome. So as a shorthand, it comes to be called the Nicene Creed. And you'll see when we look at it that the bulk of it comes from Nicaea. But. All right, now, the Creed was not the only thing they did at the Council of Nicaea. So I'm going to talk a, a, for a couple of minutes about um, other results of the Council of Nicaea. Remember Constantine's um, priority was also to discuss how to calculate the date for Easter. Constantine wanted to get everybody on the same page with regard to the date of Easter. He wanted everybody to be celebrating 
the date of Easter. And you can see that it worked because now Christians all over the world celebrate Easter on the same day, right? No. <laughs> and so even though they tried to make a rule that everyone had to celebrate Easter on the same day, and theoretically the issue was settled after the Council of Nicaea, it was not universally followed. And so people continued doing it, um, you know, the, the different ways that they had done it. And so to this day, um, our Eastern brothers and sisters celebrate Easter on a different day most of the time. Sometimes it's on the same day, but that's just a coincidence when that happens. Um, in fact, this is going to be one of the issues that will eventually separate the Eastern and Western churches. And I've got a whole lecture on that coming up later, so we'll get to it. But, uh, but this is going to be one of the things that will be kind of a, a, um, a bone of contention between East and West. What's important to note about this now is that when the Council of Nicaea uh, determined how the date of Easter should be calculated and celebrated. Uh, basically, what the council decreed was that the whole worldwide church ought to celebrate Easter on the same day as the Church of Rome. Now, um, I'm going to say why that's significant, and then I'm going to backpedal a little bit and, and give you a, a, the bigger picture. But first, why that's significant? Because this is another stepping stone on the way toward the, the Bishop of Rome becoming the, the Pope, the office of the papacy. This is another stepping stone on that uh, evolution of the See of Rome becoming the most important. And it, in some ways, it, it already is. Um, now, having said that, though, in reality, what's going on here is that the, uh, the Church of Rome is one of the major city churches that is in the majority in terms of the date for Easter. And so the, the canons of Nicaea mentioned that, you know, the, uh, that, that everyone should celebrate Easter on the same date as the, the majority of the churches do. And it lists a couple of them, but Rome is the first one listed. And so Rome, you know, has this priority of place. And um, again, this goes back to the beginning with the concept of apostolic succession and um, you know, people like Ignatius saying, you know, we all need to agree with Rome. And so that's, that sort of uh, precedent is followed here. We all need to agree with Rome. And Rome is the first church listed uh, among the majority churches who celebrate Easter on that day. Uh, now, again, though, you can see that some of the city churches, some of the churches, did not feel the need to comply. And they simply didn't. And they just kept doing what they were doing and still do to this day. Another thing, uh, and stop me if you have questions, that's totally fine. But another thing that the um, Council of Nicaea did was um, declare that the Novationists were in fact orthodox and not heretics. And the way this happened is this. Um, a Novationist bishop was invited to the Council of Nicaea. Now remember, the Novationists have separated by this time, and so they are a schismatic group. They're a separate group. They have their own bishops and their own churches. But uh, at least one Novationist bishop came to the Council of Nicaea, and he did sign the creed. And there's no reason why he shouldn't have, because if he's a follower of Novation, the idea of the father and son being consubstantial is perfectly natural to him. So what that says is that um, while the Donatists were considered heretics, primarily for their sacramental theology, the Novationists were not. The Novationists were considered orthodox. Um, and in fact, the, um, the canons of, of Nicaea state that if Novationist bishops want to come back into the Catholic Church, they certainly can, as long as they agree to not be novationists anymore. I mean, basically, they have to agree to reconcile anyone whom the Catholic Church would reconcile. So they have to act like Catholic bishops. Now, again, notice how I keep using the word Catholic. We started with this word meaning universal, but then it quickly has the connotation of, of a sort of exclusive universal. In other words, we're Catholic and you're not, right? And so we've already seen how it's got that 
connotation. So there's the Catholic uh, Church, which is sort of the majority, the mainstream church. Um, and then there are these, these heretical groups. But now for the first time, with the Novationists, we have a group that's acknowledged by a worldwide council as Christian, but not Catholic. So they're Orthodox, they're not heretics, but they're still schismatic. So they're Christian, but not Catholic. That's the first time that's really happened. Well, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, yeah, well, this is the first time. With, with the Novationists, we have the first time that um, a group is officially recognized as Christian, but not Catholic. In other words, it affirms and accepts the idea that there could be separated brethren, brothers and sisters, who are not under the same hierarchy, and yet who are also not heretics. Now this is going to call into question the idea of no salvation outside the church. Because if they're not heretics, then that implies that their Christology leads to a soteriology that works. And yet, are they or are they not in the church, capital C? Uh, it's a question that doesn't really get answered, because eventually the Novationists will be somewhat persecuted by the mainstream, especially in the West. And um, in the 5th century in the West, they die out, and they, they die out in the East by the, um, by the 7th or 8th century or so. Uh, so. And when I say they die out, it means that you know they... they they stop being separate and sort of get folded back into the mainstream church. Um, another thing that happens after Nicaea is that um, apparently having non-bishops present was perceived as a little bit too chaotic. And so there were priests and even lay people at the Council of Nicaea, and I mentioned there, there were confessors and there were hermits. But, but Nicaea is really the last major council that is going to allow priests and lay people to be there. Um, for the most part, it's going to be bishops only invited to the major councils. A couple of other rules that come up uh, from the Council of Nicaea. Uh, a prohibition against ordination right after baptism. Now, you may remember some stories from the earlier centuries of the church where there's a figure who is so well respected and so well liked, or if a person who is considered to be such a great speaker that when that person becomes Christian, he is baptized and then immediately ordained priest or even bishop, right? And we see, uh, well, it, it even happens with um, Ambrose of Milan after this. So, uh, but there is a rule here that you don't. Uh, ordain somebody to the clergy immediately after they got baptized. There ought to be some time in between there, which sort of makes sense. Um, there's a prohibition also against uh, clergy having women in their homes who are not a mother, sister, or aunt. Hmm. Uh, so, this is right at the time when there, there are questions about whether clergy are going to be expected to be celibate. And as you know, in the East, uh, priests are not going to be expected to be celibate. In the East, uh, priests may marry and have a family, but the bishops are expected to be celibate. Uh, normally in the East, the bishops, are, uh, the bishops come from the monastic orders. Um, so... In, in the West, we are, we're already in that place where there's an expectation of a celibate clergy. It's not always followed, but that's becoming the expectation. But what's happening is, in some places, you have clergy, priests, or even bishops, who have you know, housekeepers who live with them, and you know, basically they're you know, a common-law wife, or, um, or you know, whatever. So the Council of Nicaea makes a ruling that clergy may not have women living in their homes who are not a close relative, you know, something that wouldn't arouse suspicion. Another rule is a prohibition against what's called the translation of bishops from one see to another. The see, you remember, is the, the city or the place of a bishop's authority. If you are the bishop of 
let's say, Antioch, that implies that you're from Antioch. Because remember, the whole, the, the whole underlying assumption here of apostolic succession is that you, you know, your theology, if you're the bishop, your theology comes from the previous bishops in that city. That it, that it comes down through the succession of bishops in a particular city. So if you're the bishop of Antioch, it means you're from Antioch. So this rule prohibits bishops from moving from one see to another. Now the point there is, is really twofold. One, it's, I think, to preserve the concept of apostolic succession and to preserve that pedigree of theology. But also, it's to prevent clergy from getting ideas about being upwardly mobile in the sense of, wow, you know, um, I, I, I should be thankful to be the bishop of Evanston, but I'd really like to be the bishop of Chicago because, boy, wouldn't that be a primo gig, right? So the idea is you're not supposed to have your eyes on other seeds, uh, which is kind of an interesting pun. But, um, but you get the idea. <laughs> Now, even though the Council of Nicaea decrees that bishops may not translate from one see to another, watch what happens, because it's going to be, uh, it's going to happen real soon. Another rule is that bishops must respect the excommunications of other bishops. Now, this is an important rule, because we have seen this problem ever since we talked about Hippolytus in Rome, right? And now, uh, more recently, we saw it with um, Alexandria. The Bishop of Alexandria excommunicates Arius, but he can just go to Nicomedia, and the place is full of his friends, and uh, you know, or Antioch, or whatever. So, if one bishop does not respect the excommunications of another bishop, it renders excommunication sort of ineffective as, as a method of discipline, right? If you can just go to another city, then what's the point? Is that questioning? Yes, sir. Yeah. I have a question in regards to excommunication. Uh -huh. um, and I've been thinking about this the past couple weeks, but um, are there still excommunications today? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. The, uh, the question was, are there, are, are there still excommunications today? The answer is yes, but it depends on the denomination. Some denominations do it, and some don't. Um, in the ancient denominations, like Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, you absolutely can get excommunicated. And um, every once in a while, you know, if you watch the news, there'll be, there'll be an item about, you know, some, so let's say, Roman Catholic theology professor who starts teaching something or writes a book, and the Vatican gets a hold of it and says, ah, this is outside the bounds. And they will say, you know, you need to stop teaching this or recant or something. And if the person refuses, they can be excommunicated. And once excommunicated, what happens to that person? I know back then it was outlaw. They were either they were outlaw. And yeah, you could be exiled or whatever. But but today excommunication means what it originally meant, excluded from communion. So the idea is if you're excommunicated. It's not as though you're kicked out of the church entirely, like you can't show up in church ever. But you're not expected to go up to receive the sacrament. You are excluded from the sacrament of communion, which means that if you want to be uh, reconciled with the table of the Eucharist, you need to be reconciled with your bishop. And because the bishop holds the authority over that, and so uh, you need to do whatever the authority says you need to do in order to be reconciled again. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the bottom line. There, are, there have been occasions, and again, sometimes you'll hear about this in the news, where uh, a politician proposes or supports a position that the church does not support. And the bishop of the area where the politician is from will excommunicate that politician and say, until you stop saying this, 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 you are not welcome at the table of the Eucharist. And it usually creates a big hullabaloo. Is that a word? Yes. Last question. Sorry. Yes, that is okay. In regards to those that, you know, in the Catholic Church where there have been no scandals, yeah. 
has um, have they resulted in excommunication? Um, because I'm, uh, I don't know if all of them or some of them have they resulted in excommunication based on their actions. I know we were ta talking about what they teach and that sort yeah, of thing, but right. the actions. Uh, behavior certainly can result in excommunication, but um, usually excommunication is reserved for the unrepentant. In other words, so if, if you commit a sin, whatever the sin is, you know, if it's serious enough and the church comes to you and says, you have excommunicated yourself by your actions. So, I mean, the, the, some of the scandals that you're thinking of would clearly, you know, fit uh, in that category. You have excommunicated yourself by your actions. Now, at that point, when a person gets caught, they are often humbled and usually repentant. Uh, and so then, you know, they might be... Uh, forgiven. Yeah, right. So they, so they might be forgiven. They might be reconciled at that point without any real formal excommunication. Uh, but if the person were to remain obstinate and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, not wish to... Um, stop the behavior, then that person would be excommunicated. Yes? It's a little, little more serious in countries or uh, places that the church is your representative in the state. Yes, good point. So in my case, in, our, in Syria, if I have to belong to certain church. Moving from one church to another, I have to change my register with the government. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. If I'm excommunicated, I have no place to be buried in. I have no rights. Yeah. My marriage, my uh, properties are are illegal. Yeah. Right. And so, so what, it depends what country is it and where, how are the rules there. And what country is that? Well, most of Middle Eastern countries are yeah. the same. Yeah. I'm from Syria. I won't go there. <laughs> well, That's but in this case, you're talking about. This is a Christian context, um, yeah. and and I think that there would be similarities with Greece. Um, but again, you know, notice it's Ottoman Empire rule. They set this thing, and right. it continues for the last couple of centuries. Well, but but this this tradition goes back to Constantine, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about how in the East there is going to be more of a connection between church and state, and. Um, with the assumption that, it, it, in a sense, the state rules over the church. Now, that can work to the church's advantage sometimes when the state supports the church, but it can be a disadvantage too. In the West, we're going to see it's more church over state. In the East, it's more state over church. But in, you know, in your countries where you have a sort of national church, um, you still have very much what you had in the time of Constantine, where the, uh, the the excommunication of the church is is going to be and minorities, by the power of the state. minorities or faith communities are represented by the church mm -hmm. or whatever faith community is it, it is, and whole your life is organized around that rep representation that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is quite serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like that situation in the early church, remember that not only was there a belief that there's no salvation outside the church. So if you're excommunicated, you're, you're also outside the kingdom. You're that guy without the wedding garment thrown out to the outer darkness, right? Not only are you that guy, but you have, you know, you, you risk not getting a Christian burial if you should die in a state of excommunication. So, um, I mean, these things uh, were, were very serious. Uh, yeah, but what's this idea of the excommunication? Did it kind of come from the idea of the ancient Greek policies of, you know, from one policy to another policy, you know, if the guy is causing some trouble, then you're ostracized, and then you, you are a mega bond then, so you don't exist, you know? Well, that is a great question. I'm wondering, since you know, a lot of Greek philosophy is in this early stage, I'm yeah. wondering, were they influenced by that idea, that ancient concept? Of That's a great question, um, and I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer it. I mean, in case you didn't hear, the question was, is this idea of excommunication somewhat based on the idea of the, of the Greek city, where um, you, ha you have to be a good citizen, and um, but you have to belong to some city, and if you move from one city to the next, you might need a letter of reference or something like that. I mean, you know, even to this day, I mean, you know, if you, if you change churches, your, where you register, they might ask for a letter from your previous church. Now, to answer your question, though, I don't know how far I would go with this, because 
we do actually have the precedent for excommunication in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 5. So where Paul talks about, you know, uh, distancing yourself from the unrepentant sinner. Uh, so theologically, the precedent comes from there. Now, would you want to do a New Testament paper on whether Paul got the idea from, you know, the, from the Greek idea? I don't know, but, um, but that's really what it goes back to. Good question. That, that actually may go back to more uh, Stoic ethical with uh, Seneca, who was, who was uh, one of Paul's contemporaries in terms of when you support, you know, when you follow, live a virtuous life, you're supporting the empire, but you're also supporting, you know, the, the corporate city itself. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, we talked about the debate uh, over uh, the sacraments after the persecutions and, the, and the, the controversy over the lapsed. And, you know, it, the question sort of becomes, who are we helping by excommunicating someone? You know, are we keeping the church pure by, by excommunicating the impure? Or are we really helping the person by excommunicating them and showing them just how serious this, this sin is or this heresy is? And, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a two sides of the same coin, maybe. At least that would, that's what they would argue. Okay, so there's one more thing I want to mention as a result of the Council of Nicaea, and then we're going to take a break. Um, as you know, uh, we talked about the evolution of the office of the bishop, the episcopacy, right? And you know about the concept of one bishop per city, and you know that... Um, you know, we now have a situation where um, there is more easy communication between bishops, between cities, but we also that, that also means that there's more opportunity for disagreement between bishops and between cities. Um, now, going on the assumption of apostolic succession, we have a tradition that, you know, at least in theory, everyone is supposed to agree with Rome because Rome is the church of Peter. Now, uh, Antioch also claims Peter, but, uh, but what the Council of Nicaea did was it began to define the hierarchy of the major metropolitan sees, the, the major uh, cities. And so, in, at, at the Council of Nicaea, we have the, uh, the, the most influential or the most authoritative Cs or cities define, uh, and the number one city is Rome. So we have Rome at the top of the list, and again, you know, this is no small step on that uh, trajectory of the Bishop of Rome, uh, the office of the Bishop of Rome becoming the papacy as we know it. Um, now, uh, after Rome, the next two most important cities are going to be Alexandria, and Antioch. Now, as you know, Rome is in the west, Alexandria and Antioch are in the east. Um, the, uh, the next metropolitan that is mentioned at this point is, and maybe only for sentimental reasons, uh, Jerusalem. Now, we also have uh, a couple of other important cities who are on the list, and I would, I would argue that um, Eusebius of Caesarea's C is one of them, Caesarea, uh, probably more important than Jerusalem, though Jerusalem has some uh, authority as the sort of mother church, but both of these are not as important as Alexandria and Antioch. But the problem here for them is that Alexandria and Antioch, being the two most important cities in the East, kind of cancel each other out, especially when they argue with each other. Um, the other city that is on the list of, uh, of most important cities is Carthage. Carthage is the second city of the West, it's in North Africa, but it is clearly not as important as Rome. 
Now, um, in the next hour, we're going to talk about the Council of Constantinople. I already told you that Constantine will create a new city, Nova Roma, New Rome, which comes to be called Constantinople, or Constantine's city, right? Why wasn't the Council of Nicaea just held in Constantinople? I mean, if that's going to be the new capital, right, why not just have it there? Because it wasn't built yet. The Council of Nicaea was in 325. The city of Constantinople wasn't really dedicated until like 330. Not 330 in the afternoon, but the year, 330. And um, so it wasn't there yet, really. But when we come to the next ecumenical council, it will be held in Constantinople. So the Council of Constantinople is going to be in the year 381, and we'll talk about that in the next hour. But at the Council of Constantinople, Constantinople as a city will be added to the list of the most important metropolitans. And it will be added at the top of the list of the eastern metropolitans. Um, so it's going to edge out Alexandria and Antioch because, after all, it's the capital. But even though the Council of Constantinople is held in Constantinople, and even though it is now the new imperial capital, the council will clarify that the city of Constantinople is second after Rome in authority. So Rome still maintains priority of place. So, um, and as if that's not enough, there's five metropolitan sees in the east and only two in the west. And in the west, Rome really has no competition from Carthage, uh, though Carthage is important. Um, and so you can see how this falls out and, and how Rome becomes officially the, the sea uh, of highest authority the Metropolitan uh, at the top of the list. Okay, now let's see if there are any uh, last minute questions before we take a break. Okay, then let's uh, take a break and let's come back at um, like five minutes to eight, which is a little over 15 minutes. All right, see you then.